uh, Geraldine calls Johnny Toko, says, I'm really worried. I haven't heard from Sonny in a few days. Can you go over to the house? I'm, I don't know what happened. He goes over to the house. The door is locked. He can't get in. He sees Sonny's car in the driveway. He calls somebody at the, either the sheriff's department or police department, who he knows. He says, we got to get in the house here. I'm, I'm worried here. They open the house. She, he sees, and the cops that were there, sees the same thing that Mildred Stevens saw. Sonny has a fucking needle in his arm. Sonny was not a drug addict. He may have done some drugs. I know he did cocaine. He smoked marijuana. He, I don't, uh, I didn't really look into that aspect of his life. A lot of people are more interested in his death than they are in his life. And that's a tragedy in itself. Johnny Toko is upset. They were very close. They, they knew each other in, in St. Louis on Sunday fall in St. Louis. Johnny Toko leaves. Okay, this is on New Year's Day. Geraldine gets home on January 5th, the evening of January 5th. Uh, she goes in, um, into the house, lights are on, the smell is atrocious. She's with Danielle. She walks upstairs. The, the house is immaculate, by the way, at that point. She walks upstairs, sees Sonny on this bench, uh, next, which is uh, at the foot of the bed. No needle in his arm. And he's been dead for a week. His body is decomposing badly. She, she takes uh, Danielle to a neighbor's house. She maintains her composure. She calls her attorney. She says, this, you know, I mean, there's nothing he, she could do. She doesn't call the police right away, which some people think, ah, why didn't she call the police right away? Even the cop I talked to, a uh, really nice guy, Dennis Caputo who had no ax to grind with Sonny. He said, yeah, that was a little suspicious. Plus there were, there were holes in the backyard where somebody had been digging. Well, um, uh, a good young friend of Sonny's at the time, I, I talked to later, he says, they used to keep money buried in the backyard, which a lot of people did, I guess. She also called the doctor. And after two, and two hours, two and a half hours, she calls the police. People wonder, why did you wait so long? Well, she, would, she knew that the house was gonna be descended upon by press and by cops. So she did whatever she could to protect herself. The, all of her valuables or whatever, she wanted to get her affairs in order. Um, so the question was, you know, how did Sonny Liston die? Who killed him? He did not inject that on his own. Um, a man whose name escapes me uh, in 2000 and, uh, 15, I think, wrote a book about his father, who at one point, he was a mobster, he was on the FBI's most wanted list when he got arrested driving down Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles in his Cadillac convertible. He was on the top 10 most wanted list. Served time, he was estranged from his son. Just before he died, they got together and he said, I gotta tell you, I was there. I was part of the crew that was there when we killed Sonny List. And the guy wrote about it. Okay, I didn't know that when I published my first edition. Um, and so, okay, the mob killed him. I figured the mob killed him. So the question is why? Um, a drug deal gone bad, you know, was he, was he trying to horn in on the drug territory in West, uh, West Las Vegas, which is a really rough part of town? Well, there are a lot of people in New Jersey who know will tell you for a fact that Sonny Liston was killed in retribution for not throwing his final fight against Chuck Webner. Because, you know, Sonny was, he was done already. Um, and they were, uh, Chuck Webner was a journeyman his whole career, but he was in line for a big Madison Square Garden fight. Um, Johnny Toko was in a coffee shop with Sonny when a couple of mobsters motioned, motioned him over. Sonny was gone for like three hours. Uh, and he said, what's going on, Sonny? Eh, relax, I'm gonna knock this guy out. You know, because he figured, he knew they were mobsters, so they want you to fix the fight. Don't worry about it. Sonny's not gonna throw a fight for money. They offered him $7,000. He got $13,000 for his last fight. Five years, six years removed from being the heavyweight champ of the world. He was paid 13 damn thousand dollars to fight Chuck Webner. 
So they have from another seven. Dad, Sonny, it's 20 grand. It's easy money. Just, you know, make it look good. But you got to lose this fight, Sonny. I would take it as a personal favor. Sonny bludgeons right now. Okay, so Sonny's in his dressing room. There's a woman there waiting for him. He gets out of the shower. And uh, uh, I think the guy's name is Don DeGilio. And three of his henchmen, big mob guys, are waiting for him in his dressing room. DeGilio throws a, uh, an envelope, $7,000 at his chest, falls to the floor. He says, N-word, the next time we see you, you're a dead man. They leave. Sonny is so scared. He leaves his cup and his boots behind. He leaves home with his clothes in his hand in his robe. Okay. Six months later, um, somebody had to betray him. Maybe it was one of the two uh, hookers that Sonny was with that day. Gary Bates told me um, that he ran into a guy and we tried to find him at a construction site. And the guy noticed uh, Gary Bates, who was a journeyman heavyweight, he lost to Cooney, he lost to uh, uh, Ken Norton. He lost to a lot of people. He, he had his, uh, like a 14 and 14 record. And the guy saw his boxing gear on the front seat. He says, yeah, I used to star with Sonny Liston. He said, well, you know, I, I delivered uh, heroin to Sonny's house uh, for, the, for the two hookers he was with, the two junkies he was with. Uh, the day before he died. And um, so um, I have a feeling that one of them betrayed Sonny, maybe left the front door unlocked because there was an epic struggle. Struggle. Sonny fought for his life and he finally got some dude and they injected him with an overdose, you know, a hot dose that, uh, that killed him. Johnny Tokyo said probably get, inject him enough, enough heroin to kill a horse. Um, so he's there for like five days before his wife gets home. The sheriff at the time was a real tough guy. His name escapes me right now. He must have called the mob. Um, and, he, you know, even the mob was afraid of the sheriff. And they said, look, you left the place. I, it, the way the house looks now, because the cops told him, you know, the house is a mess. You know, I don't want an investigation here. Clean up the fucking house. You, you know, you kill them, fine. I, who the hell cares? Um, so, yeah, Geraldine comes home. There's no sign of a struggle. There's no sign of anything except Sonny uh, on the bench with a decomposing body, which is the coroner was carrying it out. His body was so decomposed, it almost split. I hate to say this, as disgusting as it is, it almost split as they were putting him into a body bag. They, it was so heavy, they dropped him like three or four times on the way to the on the way to the hearse or whatever they call it. So yeah, um, he did not kill himself. The mob killed him with a heroin overdose. And I'm 95% certain uh, that it was because he didn't throw the weapon or fight. Because my sources in, in, in New Jersey said, it's a fact, right? So, and, and it was such an undignified way for him to go out. He was a very dignified man. You ever see pictures of him dressed? He could be like a, on the cover of GQ. He, was, he could have been a male model. He was a very good looking guy with a smile that could light the room. Uh, he always dressed impeccably. And for him to go out like that, shit. Or as Sonny would say, shit, you know. Anyway, you know, I'm passionate about it. Um, the, the, the guy was, you know, he deserves better. And I've taken it upon myself since 1978 to restore the man's reputation, what it was, and to give him the legacy that he deserves.